Riding with President Roosevelt, Crown Princess Martha of Norway is saluted by a Marine Guard of Honor as she comes to accept a brand new warship transferred under the Lend-Lease Act to Norway's valiant little navy. Manned by the Prince's own countrymen, the sleek gray craft, now christened King Håkon VII, will sail beneath St. Olaf's Blue Cross of Norway. Princess Martha goes aboard to greet King Håkon's Viking crew, to wish them good hunting as they scour the seas for U-boats. America's newest land battleships prove their power on the testing ground. Called General Lee's, in honor of the South's famous Civil War leader, they're rated by ordnance experts as more powerful than anything their size. <laughs> Capable of plunging through streams up to the driver's hatch, the all-welded monsters roll on like giant living amphibians. Production and performance figures are a military secret, but there are plenty more where these came from. Mexico City's beautiful Plaza de la Constitución sees the Army's first mechanized divisions on parade as the Republic celebrates 132 years of liberty. From the National Palace, President Camacho reviews the greatest military demonstration in Mexico's long and colorful history. Jeeps, tanks, big guns, modern troops in modern motors rolling to war as allies of the United Nations. The fiery spirit of the Mexican patriot Benito Juarez marches again. Every branch of the nation's armed forces represented in the stirring display. Today, old political rivalries are dissolved. As patrol bombers roar overhead, the nation's chief executive stands with six former presidents of Mexico at his side. A dramatic living example of a people united, united to fight again for the cause of liberty. Mexico is on the march. American industry has met the challenge of war. American factories have achieved the impossible. American mass production is delivering the goods. Going first to the great automobile assembly lines, capable of turning out four million trucks and passenger cars a year, United States engineers harnessed the skill, mobilized the resources of the most efficient manufacturing system in the world. Peacetime construction was halted overnight Tons of machinery and hundreds of plants were hauled away for the duration by workmen converting to war. Armed guards took over. The nation's key factories, already charted for just such an emergency, were equipped and made ready. In hundreds of peaceful towns, the main streets of America, Thousands of small industries were fitted into the national war production plan. Performing manufacturing miracles. Workmen in Denver, Colorado, for example, make parts and fashion tools that may help build a battleship in a Navy yard a thousand miles away. Small stuff. The billions of bits and pieces. A hundred thousand different parts in a single flying fortress. And every possible plant that could be retooled is turning them out, feeding them to the big assembly lines night and day. Sub-assemblies like these may be made in Chicago for airplanes finished in California. Motors and replacements for thousands upon thousands of planes a year. Where automobile fenders once were made, 
Aircraft propellers are turned out by the thousands. Where watch cases and compacts once were made, now shell cases by the millions. Assembly lines of machine guns moving to war on the same conveyors that only yesterday carried American typewriters. Ladies' lipsticks surrender to war needs that small arms ammunition may be sped to the front. Only coordinated mass production can turn out anti-aircraft guns at the present staggering rate. And this is only the beginning. Only in plants like these could such a gigantic job of production be achieved overnight. This is industrial America at war. The arsenal of democracy delivering the goods. From the United States, Nelson Rockefeller, coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, arrives in Rio de Janeiro to ratify a new trade agreement to supply food for Brazilian war workers. He is welcomed by President Vargas and Brazil's First Lady. Here is America's good neighbor policy at work. The treaty ratified. Three and a half million dollars worth of food to be supplied by both nations to workers in Brazil's vital war industries. Ambassador Caffrey affixes his signature for the United States as Brazil steps up war production for the United Nations. At the airport, Foreign Minister Aranha and the entire cabinet go to welcome General Justo. A former president of the Argentine, General Justo comes to place his sword in the service of Brazil. President Vargas warmly embraces his old friend. Staunch supporter of the cause of the United Nations, General Justo translates his words of action into the deed. He's ready to fight. American shock troops of the Airborne Command, parachutists and infantrymen, practice an assault upon an enemy airdrome, an authentic demonstration of the tactics of 20th century warfare. Carrying all of the equipment and personnel of a self-sustaining army, they move to the attack on wings. Parachute detachments lead the way. Just as in Holland, in Belgium, in Norway, in Crete, the element of surprise strikes the decisive blow. Their jobs to storm strategic objectives, cut communication lines, hold key positions until infantry arrives, and they land ready for instant action. Troop transports roar in with airborne reinforcements. Speedily, they unlimber scout cars and field guns. Swarming over the countryside, the infantry consolidates positions already won. The airport is captured and held. Practice today for tomorrow's actual test by gunfire. 